Hello, this is Professor Roman. We are almost ready to start talking about vector spaces, which is the main object of study in linear algebra. But before we do so, I want to give you a little bit of perspective so that you can see the place of vector spaces within abstract algebra. And actually, there are other reasons that we'll discuss in a minute. But let's step back even one step further very briefly and talk about mathematical structures in general. Speaking very generally, mathematics itself can be described as the study of non-empty sets that possess a certain structure. And to illustrate this, I made a short list of about a dozen different areas of mathematics. And this list and the, the description here is an oversimplification to be sure, but it does make the point. Mathematical logic is the study of sets with a deductive structure that allows us to define the vital concepts of proof and theorem, as well as other ideas. Set theory is the study of general sets, but with a particular emphasis on sets that have a special order structure known as a well-ordering. If you took my transition course, you would uh, have seen this concept and some of its consequences. In fact, cardinal numbers are special types of ordinal numbers, which are special types of well-ordered sets. And a great deal of set theory is devoted to the study of both ordinal numbers and cardinal numbers. Graph theory is the study of generally finite sets with a structure that comes from a binary relation. Number theory is the study of the integers, which is a set with an incredibly rich order and arithmetic structure. It may seem as though the integers are pretty simple, but that is quite deceptive. There are many questions about the integers that we have not been able to answer. Order and lattice theory is the study of sets with a structure that comes from a partial order. And of course you know that if you have watched these videos. Point set topology is the study of sets with a structure that allows us to define the general concepts of continuity with which you are probably familiar from calculus, compactness, and connectedness. Mathematical analysis is the study of <clears throat> the sets Rn, Euclidean space, with a differentiability structure. A differential geometry is the study of sets that are locally but generally not globally like Rn, and so have a local differentiability structure. So for example, the surface of a sphere is locally like the plane. If you were on the surface of a sphere, <clears throat> and all you could see was an immediate neighborhood it would look like a slightly curved plane. And the curvature is not necessarily an issue. Not for differentiability anyway. But if you saw the whole sphere, you would realize that this was different from a plane. Probability is the study of sets with a structure that allows us to define the likelihood of future events. 
Measure theory <clears throat> is the study of sets with a structure that allows us to define the general notions of length, area, and volume. They're just referred to as measure. Euclidean, affine, and projective geometry is the study of sets <clears throat> with a structure that allows us to define the notions of angle, parallelism, and invariance under certain types of transformations. And finally, abstract algebra is the study of sets with an algebraic structure imposed by <clears throat> arithmetic or algebraic operations. They're the same thing. Some people would say arithmetic, some would say algebraic. Now let's take a look at algebraic structures. Abstract algebra is the study of non-empty sets that are given an algebraic structure. And Al an algebraic structure is defined on a set by specifying one or more algebraic operations <clears throat> that are usually, but not always, called addition or multiplication. In fact, the operations of union, intersection, meet, and join are also algebraic operations. <clears throat> One way to distinguish algebraic operations from other types of operations is that algebraic operations are finitary, which means that they take only a finite number of inputs. Addition and multiplication take two inputs. Taking the negative of a number takes one input. But by contrast, analytic operations such as taking the limit generally involves infinitely many inputs and would be called an infinitary operation. We take limits of infinite sequences and very rarely would we take the limit of a finite sequence. <clears throat> Wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. <clears throat> And this difference between the study of finitary operations and infinitary operations <clears throat> goes a long way to give algebra and analysis quite different feelings. They seem like quite different subjects. And that's part of the reason, in any case. <clears throat> the techniques to study finitary operations are quite different than the techniques used to study infinitary operations. Algebraic operations generally are required to possess certain properties. <clears throat> and for us, that will be always be the case. Properties such as associativity or commutativity. And the number of operations and their properties, the required properties, characterize the different types of algebraic structures, such as monoids, groups, rings, fields, lattices, Boolean algebras, and of course vector spaces. <clears throat> the set upon which these various operations are defined is called the underlying set or the carrier set for the algebraic structure. And it's very important to understand that the carrier set alone is not an algebraic structure. You need the set, you need the operations, and you need their properties. So there are three parts to an algebraic structure. <laughs> In fact, a single non-empty set can generally be made into different algebraic structures by defining different 
algebraic operations on the set or by changing the properties. As you'll see as, when we talk about examples, and we, we define a few of the common algebraic structures. <laughs> it's also extremely important to understand that <clears throat> the carrier sets of an algebraic structure don't have to be sets of numbers. That's a difficult prejudice, you might say, for some students to overcome. <clears throat> if you can figure out a way to define an algebraic operation on a set of chairs, then you're entitled to call that operation addition or multiplication of chairs. Addition and multiplication are just words. They're words used to denote algebraic operations. And algebraic operations can be defined on any type of set. So carrier sets are essentially any type of set. <clears throat> the most famous algebraic structure is probably the real numbers along with the usual algebraic operations of addition and multiplication. But as you undoubtedly know, the set, which I'm going to write script M sub N of R, we've already talked about that, of real N by N matrices <coughs> is the carrier set for an algebraic structure defined by the operations of matrix addition and matrix multiplication. Turns out that that uh, structure is known as a ring, and we'll talk about rings in a minute. <coughs> also, the set of functions say, on the real numbers, is the carrier set for an algebraic structure defined by addition and multiplication of functions, something you would have learned how to do in calculus. Uh, another familiar algebraic structure is the power set of a set, where the algebraic operations are union and intersection, and also complement. Uh, and under those three operations, union, intersection, and complement, the power set is an algebraic structure known as a Boolean algebra. Linear algebra is the study of a particular algebraic structure known as a vector space. And we'll give the definition of a vector space fairly soon. No branch of mathematics can be studied in a vacuum. And of course, linear algebra is no exception. Every branch of mathematics depends to one degree or another, and sometimes very heavily, on other branches. Linear algebra depends to varying degrees on group theory, ring theory, field theory, and lattice theory. And this is the reason. A vector space is a group, in fact. Every vector space is defined in terms of a field of scalars. The ring of matrices and the ring of polynomials play fundamental roles in linear algebra. You may be familiar, for example, with the characteristic polynomial of a matrix. That's just one example. There's another related polynomial called the minimal polynomial of a matrix. The family of subspaces of a vector space is a complete lattice. No need to panic. You don't need to be an expert in group theory, ring theory, field theory, and lattice theory to study linear algebra. But to do a comprehensive job, to do a proper job studying linear algebra, you should be at least familiar with the definitions of these algebraic structures. And in particular, in the case of fields, just a little bit of their basic facts. So that's what we're going to do 
very soon and uh, then we will be able to start our study of vector spaces. <coughs> the uh, subject of lattices is covered in an appendix to the book and in a previous lecture in this series, so I don't need to speak further about lattices. <coughs> but let's look at the other algebraic structures. First, we need to talk about algebraic operations. There are three types of algebraic operations that are particularly important, one of which actually stands out more than the other two. A nullary operation on a set is simply an element of the set. It might seem strange to create a term for an element of a set, but it provides some consistency with the other types of operations, although you will often find that authors don't bother to refer to nullary operations, they just simply talk about elements, and that's fine. A unary operation on a set A is just a function from A to itself. And here again, you will often find in elementary treatments that authors will simply refer to functions rather than call them unary operations. A binary operation is a function from the Cartesian product A cross A to A. One can define higher airy operations. The word airy refers to the number of, of factors in the domain. So a ternary operation would be a function from A cross A cross A to A, for example. But those types of operations are much less common, and uh, so we don't need to discuss them. Binary operations are the centerpiece by which the algebraic structures are defined, and you'll see why in a, in a minute. <clears throat> As to binary operations, a binary operation F maps an ordered pair, AB, to an element, F of AB. But it's more usual to denote a binary operation using an arithmetic notation, because that's what they are intended to describe in the context of abstract algebra. And there are two such notations multiplicative notation, in which case we call the binary operation multiplication, and denoted by symbols such as a dot, a star, or just by juxtaposition. So all of these would be read A times B, or this one would be read AB. <clears throat> and it's the product of A and B which, by the way, might be different from the product of B and A. If you swap the order of the factors, you may get a different element. <clears throat> In additive notation, the binary operation is called addition and written with a plus sign. So this would be the sum of A and B. Let's take a look now at some of these structures we've been talking about. But I'm going to start as a warm-up with one of the simplest structures uh, that are uh, useful in abstract algebra, and that's the monoid. A monoid is a non-empty set M together with a single binary operation on M with the following properties. And I've given the 
properties twice, once using multiplicative notation, once using additive notation, so you can see the difference. Associativity looks like this under multiplicative notation. Under additive notation, it looks like this. Identity. Under multiplicative notation, there is an identity element, and it's denoted by the digit 1. So this is a nullary operation, and it has this property. 1 times a equals a times 1 equals a for all a and m. You can think of a, an identity as a neutral element with respect to multiplication. It does nothing when you multiply by 1. Under additive notation, the identity is denoted by the element 0, called a 0 element, and this is what the property, required property of the identity is uh, written additively. 0 plus a equals a plus 0 equals a. Both of these notations are used. The multiplicative notation is more common for monoids, but that doesn't preclude someone from preferring to use the additive notation uh, but it would be used primarily when the monoid was also commutative, which means a plus b equals b plus a for all a and b in the monoid. Additive notation is reserved for algebraic structures that are commutative but I wanted you to see the difference in the notations, so I gave both versions. If I didn't want to make this point, I probably would not have given you the additive version. So it's important to keep in mind, using additive notation is done almost exclusively when the uh, operation is commutative. The, the uh, concept of a monoid seems quite general. Any set with any binary operation that is associative and has a neutral element, an identity, is a monoid. But it is surprising how useful monoids are in mathematics as well as in, for example, computer science and the study of formal languages and other places in computer science. <clears throat> the natural numbers form a monoid under addition, in fact a commutative monoid. Notice that I have said the natural numbers form a monoid and I have stated the operation. That's critical because as we have said before, the carrier set by itself is not an algebraic structure. In fact, the natural numbers also form a monoid under multiplication. Again, commutative. Okay, let's take a look at groups. If we require one additional property of our monoids, we get groups. A group is a non-empty set G together with a binary operation, often denoted by juxtaposition or by a dot or a star, called multiplication. So what this is saying is the groups are often written using multiplicative notation, but must have the following properties. G has to be a monoid 
under the binary operation. I could stop there, but since this is your first exposure probably to monoids, I wrote out what that means again. It means that the operation is associative and that there is an identity element. The additional requirement of a group that does not have to hold for a monoid is that for each element little a in G there is another element it could be the same element and this is read A inverse called the inverse of A for which A times A inverse equals A inverse times A equals 1 the identity so here we have a nullary operation we have a binary operation to start with we have a nullary operation and we have a unary operation, namely the map or function that sends A to, ah, this should be A inverse. So if you uh, look at this definition for a minute, um, I didn't have to refer, I didn't have to put these, this text in parentheses, I could have left it out and just said there's an element called the identity element with this property. And I could have dropped mention of, on this line here too. So it would look like there was only one operation, namely the binary operation of multiplication. But hidden in that definition is a unary operation and a, a nullary operation and a unary operation. So I could have even made that more emphatic by starting this sentence by saying there exists a nullary operation 1 in G. And here I could have said there exists a unary operation sending an element A to an element A inverse. So there's a little variation in language here. But the main point I'm making is that a group is a non-empty set with three operations, a nullary, a unary, and a binary. And each of those operations has certain properties. That's a cleaner definition, really, <clears throat> than talking about elements and inverses without mentioning that they are, in fact, operations. And the cleaner definition generalizes. It's possible to study non-empty sets with arbitrary operations. They are called universal algebras. And then one doesn't speak about elements directly. One speaks about oper uh, nullary operations. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, don't worry too much about that. I uh, just wanted you to hear it once. The important thing is to have a feeling for this definition as I have written it. Okay. In some, sometimes we require commutativity for a group. Many groups are commutative. Such groups are called commutative groups or abelian groups. And the extra requirement is the commutative law, AB equals BA, for all A and B in the group. <clears throat> the term abelian is, uh, comes from the mathematician Niels Heinrich Abel, who lived from 1802 to 1829. He was one of the early developers of group theory. Just as an historical note, Abel, unfortunately, died of tuberculosis at the age of 26. Nevertheless, he had time to prove that there is no general algebraic formula similar to the quadratic formula using only the four basic arithmetic operations and the taking of nth roots 
for solving all polynomial equations of degree 5 or higher. This is one of the cornerstone achievements in all of mathematics. <clears throat> there is also a famous mathematician named Felix Klein. You might have heard of the Klein bottle. He made a very remarkable comment about Abel. Abel was a brilliant mathematician. He did a lot of other things in his short career. So I, here's a quote from Klein about Abel. But I would not like to part from this ideal type of researcher. He's talking about Abel such as has seldom appeared in the history of mathematics without evoking a figure from another sphere who, in spite of his totally different field, still seems related. Thus, although Abel shared with many mathematicians a complete lack of musical talent, I will not sound absurd if I compare his kind of productivity and his personality with Mozart's. I think that's high praise indeed. Abelian groups are often, but not always, denoted using additive notation, writing and then A plus B instead of AB. To be perfectly clear, multiplicative notation is always used for non-abelian groups. But for abelian groups, we use both notations. They're both very common. So if you, if you see a group written multiplicatively, you can't assume it's not abelian. It could still be abelian. So you could still have AB equals BA. But as I spoke a minute ago about monoids, when you use a plus sign in the additive notation, you are implying the group, in this case, is commutative. Here's the definition of an abelian group, just so you can see the difference in notation. We have the binary operation called addition, denoted by a plus sign. It's associative. There's an identity, a zero element. <clears throat> Every element, A and G, has an inverse under addition, but that's generally called the negative of the element. And it's always written with the minus sign. You can call this the additive identity and that does uh, some people do uh, especially to contrast it with a multiplicative identity but the term negative is far more common and the commutative law a couple of examples of groups the set of all bijective functions from a set to itself these are also known as permutations, especially when the set's finite, but also when the, the set's infinite, the term's appropriate. This is a group under composition of functions. But as you no doubt know from calculus, that's not an abelian group in general. Composition is not commutative. The set of m by n real matrices is an abelian group under addition of matrices, the usual addition that you already know about. The identity is the zero matrix. Also, the set of square n by n real matrices this is a group under addition, but it's not a group under multiplication because not all 
non-zero matrices have multiplicative inverses. But if you restrict the carrier set to just the invertible matrices of size n by n, then you do get a non-abelian, at least when n is bigger than 1, a non-abelian group under multiplication. The square matrices are a, a, an abelian group under addition, of course, but as to multiplication, you must restrict to invertible matrices. If n is bigger than or equal to 2, then this set z sub n, usually just zn, is the set of natural numbers from 0 to n minus 1. This is a group under addition modulo n. It's not a group under multiplication mod n unless well, actually, well, I'll talk about that later, uh, unless you exclude zero, the non-zero members, and unless n is prime. Let's move on to rings. <clears throat> a ring is an algebraic structure with two binary operations that called addition and multiplication. You don't want to call them both addition, it's confusing, or both multiplication would be confusing. As I mentioned before, the study of linear algebra depends very heavily on two specific rings, the ring of matrices and the ring of polynomials. A ring is a non-empty set R together with two binary operations, addition and multiplication, under which R is an abelian group under addition so associative and what we'll now call an additive identity or zero element. Uh, I should probably have added the word additive here too. Additive inverses known as negatives and since it's an abelian group under addition we need the commutative law. Under multiplication, R is not necessarily a group, but it must be a monoid. Associative, multiplicative identity. Generally just called the identity. That's a bit confusing, but as long as you refer to the additive identity as zero, <clears throat> you can refer to the element one as the identity And then the two operations are connected by the distributive law. So what's missing on the multiplicative side are multiplicative inverses. So the operation of multiplication in a ring is weaker than addition because there don't have to be multiplicative inverses, but there do have to be additive inverses. <clears throat> A ring is said to be commutative if multiplication is commutative. And incidentally, one never says abelian ring. The word abelian is, is uh, reserved for groups. I tell my students sometimes, uh, if you're going to use the term abelian ring, you cannot tell anybody you took my class in algebra. The set Zn that we saw earlier is a commutative ring under addition and multiplication mod n. And I will use the, these notations here for those operations. A plus sign with a circle for addition mod n and a dot with a circle for multiplication mod n. These notations are not complete because they don't show the number n, 
and of course you change in, you change the operations. But that's uh, that's going to be okay because this won't come up often. Uh, the main thing I wanted to do was put a circle around these so you know they're not ordinary addition and multiplication. <clears throat> the set of square real matrices is a non-commutative ring. And I guess I better add here n bigger than 1. When n equals 1, you're just 1 by 1 matrices are just basically real numbers and uh, they commute uh, under multiplication. Uh, so I wanted to uh, have to add this. <clears throat> this is a non-commutative ring under matrix addition and multiplication. The set of real polynomials is a commutative ring under the usual operations of addition and multiplication. In fact, that's true of polynomials in any number of variables, even infinitely many. <clears throat> Finally, we come to fields. A field is a special type of ring. You have the two binary operations. F, it, their field is called F. F is an abelian group under addition, just like a ring, same properties. F star, which is the common notation for the non-zero elements in any ring, or in particular in a field, is an abelian group under multiplication. So this look, these properties look the same as for rings, but we have the additional property of requiring all non-zero elements in the field to have a multiplicative inverse. And then we have the distributive property. A field, according to the definition, must contain at least two elements. And the reason for that requirement is to avoid certain pathological problems, or one in particular, a pathological case in which the two identities might be the same. If 0 equals 1, and we can't call it a field, but if, if we had all these properties but 0 equaled 1, then for any element a in f, we could write a equals a times 1, which equals a times 0, which equals 0. And so the whole thing collapses to a single element, 0. And we don't want the singleton set, 0, to be considered a field. Not, there would be no multiplicative inverses, for example, and it just uh, wouldn't be appropriate. So that's why there's this special requirement for fields that they must have at least two elements to avoid this problem of 0 equals 1 and the resulting trivial field wouldn't be appropriate. As to examples, um, the, the rational, real, and complex numbers form fields under the usual operations. And <clears throat> the, it, one can show that the ring Zn is a field if and only if n is a prime number. Z2 is particularly important. This then is a field, because 2 is prime. This is the set. Now, the carrier set is just 0, 1. Addition mod 2, multiplication mod 2. Actually, multiplication mod 2 is the same as ordinary multiplication in the natural numbers. Uh, addition mod 2 has one kink in it, and that is 1 plus 1 is 0. This is a very important field in many respects. As you know, this is the binary alphabet, so Z2 plays a, a serious role in computer science. But for us, 
we will use this field to provide some counterexamples to statements when we start studying linear algebra itself. <clears throat> this does show, by the way, that not all fields are infinite, unlike the reals and the complex field that everybody knows about. Finite fields are also very important in applications of mathematics to various disciplines and within mathematics, for example, to the field of coding theory. That's a construction of error-correcting codes. <clears throat> there are a couple of notions we need to talk about with respect to fields very briefly because they will occur only rarely in the book, but a few times, and so I want to cover them quickly. You don't have to worry too much about these right now. I'll show them to you, and when they occur, you have to remember the names so that when they do occur, you can come back here and look if you want. If F is a field and K is a subset of F of size at least 2, then the field operations of addition and multiplication can be restricted to the subset K. But this may or may not make K into a field. For example, the integers are a subset of the reals, but they do not form a field. The operations come down. You add two integers, you get an integer. You multiply two integers, you get an integer. But what you lose when you do the restriction is multiplicative inverses. Except for plus and minus one, no other integers have multiplicative inverses. The inverse of two is one half, but one half is not an integer. On the other hand, if you restrict the um, operations on R to Q, the rationals, you get a field. It can be shown that a subset K of F is a field in its own right under the restricted operations of F if and only if the subset K is closed under both operations, both binary operations, as well as both unary operations, in other words, inverses. So if AB is in K, the product's in K, the sum is in K. And if A is in K, negative A must be in K, and as long as A is not zero, A inverse must be in K. From these two properties, you can show that K is, in fact, a full-blown field. Associativity, for example, is trivial because you have associativity in the full field F, so just because you're restricting attention to a subset doesn't mean you would lose associativity. It's still there. Same for commutativity and so forth, and distributivity you do need to verify that these two properties are enough to show that the two identity elements, 0 and 1, must belong to the subset. And I'll let you ponder that. Also, since the... Oh, and so when this does happen, when K is closed under these operations, we would say then, and therefore is a field under the restricted operations, we would say that K is a subfield of F. And we'll use this notation. It's a less than or equal to, it's a common notation. Now, since the intersection of subfields of a given field is also a subfield, and I will let you ponder that, it follows that every field has a smallest subfield. You just intersect all of its subfields, you'll get a subfield, and that's got to be the smallest one. And that has a name. The smallest subfield contained in F 
is referred to as the prime subfield of F. And as I said before, that will come up once or twice, but in key places as we study linear algebra. <clears throat> the following property is strongly related to the prime subfield. If you have a field F, since 1, the multiplicative identity, must be in F by definition, these elements, n times 1, which is 1 plus 1 plus 1 and so on, n times, also have to belong to the field F. But they don't have to be distinct. If they're not distinct, one can show without too much trouble that the first time they fail to be distinct, as you look at 1 times 1, 2 times 1, 3 times 1, and so on, is when you encounter an n times 1 that actually equals 0. I forgot to put 0 times 1. That's the first one. And I'll let you think about how to prove that. It's, not, it's just a couple lines. So this prompts a definition for a field F. The smallest positive integer n for which n times 1 equals 0 is called the characteristic of the field. And I will denote it this way, C-H-A-R of F. If no such number exists, there is no smallest positive integer for which this holds, then we say that F has characteristic zero. Not infinity, as you might uh, suspect, but zero, that's the term. It's not hard to show that the characteristic of a field, if I'm going to spell that right, if it's non-zero, it must be prime, a prime number. And here's the relationship between prime subfields and characteristics. A field F has characteristic zero if and only if its prime subfield is the rational field. A field F has prime characteristic P if and only if its prime subfield is ZP. So we can characterize fields by either their prime subfield or their characteristic. They are equivalent characterizations and go back and forth between the two. I should add that when we say that the prime subfield of F is Q, we don't mean that literally. We mean that Q contains an exact copy. I'm sorry, that F contains an exact copy of Q, that there are elements. Uh, in fact, what you can do is think of it as a function that maps the rational number Rs to the field element R1 over S1. Many authors, rather than writing N1 is in F, will simply write N is in F and think of N as, an, as a natural number or integer. Same thing for rational numbers. Fields of prime characteristic have some rather strange-looking behavior. Uh, if the characteristic of F is P, then these equations hold, which would be much the delight of elementary school students, I imagine, or high school students, when it, whoever studies the binomial formula for the first time. Okay. Final comment on fields. A field is said to be algebraically closed if every non-constant polynomial 
over f has a root in f. Another way to say that is every non-constant polynomial splits over f, which means factors into a product of linear factors. They don't have to be distinct, but they have to be linear. And there's a famous theorem of mathematics that says the complex field is algebraically closed. It's not easy to prove. The real field is not algebraically closed. For instance, this real polynomial has no roots in R, cannot be factored into a product of linear factors over R. And if you do have a little bit of familiarity with vector spaces, then I, this sentence will make sense to you. This fact about algebraically closed fields that makes the study of real vector spaces much more complicated than the study of complex vector spaces, even though we think of the real field probably as simpler than the complex field. Um, in fact, we will have to spend considerable time dealing with the complexities that occur in real vector spaces that don't occur in complex vector spaces simply because not all real polynomials can be factored into linear factors.